we are going to talk about volcanic geomorphology. I'm Rose. I'm Jean. And I'm Lucy. Some examples of how volcanoes impact um, surrounding landscapes. They can create new land, erode existing land, deposit sediments in watersheds, and affect the erosional landforms and long-term evolution. So we're gonna break this down into three timescales. We're gonna look at the more immediate timescale, mid, uh, short to midterm, um, talking about mass wasting events and volcano river interactions. And then we'll wrap it up with um, longer timescales looking at um, evolution of landscapes, considering biology and erosion. Okay, to briefly introduce volcanoes, we'll look at how they're distributed around the world. You'll find volcanoes at divergent boundaries. Um, for example, mid-ocean ridges. Um, you'll find them at random spots in the world um, where mantle plumes direct hot mantle up to the surface. Um, these are called hot spots. And you'll also find them along convergent boundaries, so along continental and volcanic arcs. It's important to think about where volcanoes are placed because that can tell you about the magma composition that you can expect from those places. So thinking back to Bowen's reaction series, you'll remember that mafic materials um, have crystallized at higher temperatures. So in a magma melt, they will be the first one to crystallize out. Mafic minerals will crystallize first, and then felsic minerals will crystallize later. So in places like um, mid-ocean ridges, where magma sources are shallower and the um, oceanic crust is thinner, um, magma melts will have a shorter, shorter structure to travel through and that will produce more mafic magma. Whereas along convergent boundaries, for example, where crust is thicker, you'll find that magma has to travel further, um, giving more opportunities for the melt to crystallize mafic minerals first and also to partially melt the surrounding materials um, getting more felsic minerals into the melt. And so along convergent boundaries, you'll find that magma composition will be, will tend towards the felsic side. And so it's important to think about composition because then we look at, we can look at um, viscosity. So mafic materials will be more flowy, less viscous, whereas felsic material will be more viscous, more honey-like. And so that can guide um, volcano morphology. So an example is at the, the top image to the right, that's an example of a basaltic shield volcano. So it's made of more mafic magma. And so you'll see that it's longer and shorter. Whereas um, stratovolcanoes, like the image in the middle, um, can build itself up because it's made of more felsic, more viscous magma. And so moving on to volcanic products, and these are basically the agents of um, change of geomorphology, right? So we have lava flows, which can differ based on, again, viscosity and magma composition. You can see flows that are more mafic, they travel further, whereas um, more felsic magma can create things like domes, like the image in the bottom, it's shorter and doesn't travel as far. And then you have falls and flows which can travel further because they can um, go up into the air and so they can impact more long distance um, landscapes. Okay, so we're going to be talking first about shorter and midterm processes, um, beginning with mass wasting, which generally occurs on the shortest time scales. So um, volcanoes are particularly prone to mass wasting events um, for three main reasons. One, because of their steepness, two, because of orographic rainfall and climate effects, and three, because of an increased sediment supply. So volcanoes, especially stratovolcanoes, can be pretty steep. Stratovolcanoes are composite landforms from multiple eruptions occurring over time. The high silica content of lava flows that form stratovolcanoes make the lava viscous and resistant to flow, which can make the walls of the volcano quite steep. Second, because of the high elevation of some volcanoes, they can have their own microclimate. Orographic precipitation and cold temperatures with increased elevation result in increased rain and snowfall. Finally, as volcanoes erupt, they can expel rock fragments of various sizes. This debris, known as pyroclastic ball deposits, are often coarse, especially near the volcano, and if they're deposited slowly and at relatively cool temperatures, they will remain unconsolidated. 
In addition, the high temperatures of the volcano will enhance the weathering of the rock that makes up the volcano slope and reduce its cohesion. So as we all know, slopes fail when the factor of safety is less than one or when shear stress is greater than shear strength. So as steepness increases, the shear stress increases because it's a function of sine of the slope angle. So steeper slopes tend to have a greater risk of failure. Um, precipitation infiltrating into the rock will also decrease the shear strength because it will reduce the effect of normal stress by increasing the pore fluid pressure. So especially if the slope is covered by unconsolidated debris with a high porosity and permeability, precipitation will be able to quickly increase the pore fluid pressure. So uh, the type of sediment is important for a couple of reasons. First, the porosity and permeability of the debris controls to what degree precipitation will be able to affect the effect of normal stress and destabilize the slope. Second, the cohesion and angle of internal friction of the debris controls the shear strength of the slope. So as we know, as cohesion and internal friction decrease, the slope becomes more likely to fail. Finally, the large amount of volcanic debris that results from eruptions provides massive amounts of sediment that can be mobilized into extremely destructive landslides. One example of a super destructive type of mass wasting event from volcanoes are lahars, which is an Indonesian word that refers to mass movements of water and sediment mixed together that occur in volcanic environments. Um, lahars can occur during an eruption known as thin eruptive lahars, which are often triggered by the melting of summit snow and ice caps. They can also occur post eruptively after an eruption when volcanic craters or caldera lakes dammed with volcanic sediments are breached. Lahars are also extremely lethal. Over 30,000 deaths have been caused by lahars. Lahars can affect their surrounding environments in a couple of ways through the erosion and deposition of debris fans and um, by damming lakes, which in turn increases the risk of failure and makes lahars even more likely to, to occur. So we're seeing a positive feedback loop. Um, so Karavik et al. used fluid dynamics to model a lahar at Mount Ruapehu in New Zealand in 2007. Mount Ruapehu is an andesitic stratovolcano and dozens of both syneruptive and post-eruptive lahars have been recorded as a result of the volcano. The 2007 lahar resulted from the bursting of Crater Lake. Previous lahars have deposited sediment into the Wangahea River, which drains the lake. The morphology of the river is pretty complicated as a result of many lahars. It begins as a steep bedrock gorge that divides into both a gorge and a broader channel, which then rejoin and converge into a sometimes braided, sometimes meandering channel system where debris has been deposited into a fan. Then the channel becomes a single, fairly straight channel again. So the divergence of the Wangahea River from the patterns governing ch channel morphology we've seen in class is the result of volcanic mass wasting processes. I also found this cool figure showing the frowd number of the Lahars flow, which I found pretty interesting since we talked about frowd numbers in class. The high velocity of the mass flow material as well as the low depth of the flow result in a supercritical flow so a frad number above one for the first couple of kilometers of the lahar. So as you can imagine, um, this is extremely like super critical flow that is um, very destructive during the lahar. Now we're moving on to volcano river interactions. So there's two main ways that volcanic eruptions affect um, rivers. First, by increasing sediment yield. So eruptions can introduce tons of sediment to a watershed. And in addition to that, it can also um, trigger the remobilization of stored sediment. Second way is to rearrange flow paths. So what we've talked about in base level changes, how um, changing transport capacity and or sediment supply can initiate um, these cycles of incision, aggradation, and widening channels. And then additionally, um, volcanic eruptions, um, things like lava flows, can introduce structures that um, change the landscape and therefore change drainage courses. So one example of how eruptions um, impact rivers, um, in 1980, Mount St. Helens erupted. And you can see in the map um, in the left, we have 
a region shaded in gray that's affected by blast. There are rivers um, dashed with lines showing impact from debris avalanche, and there's dotted rivers showing impact of lahar. And the figure to the right shows a graph of sediment yield on the y-axis and time on the x-axis from 1980 when the eruption occurred up to 2000. And all these curves um, pertain to rivers. And so the curve on the, the topmost curve, the ones with circle marks, pertain to rivers that are affected by debris avalanche. And that happens to be the, um, the most disturbance. It shows the highest sediment yield all throughout the period. And then the lowermost curve, the ones with triangular marks, um, pertain to regions affected by blast. And that shows the lowest sediment yield. And so you can see from all the curves that there's a pattern from 1980 to 1992 where sediment yield um, decreases nonlinearly. Um, but the type and degree of disturbance impacts um, how fast these rivers recover from um, disequilibrium. And so the curve on the top most shows that um, debris avalanche um, happens to be the most impactful in terms of throwing off um, rivers equilibrium and it takes the longest to recover. Um, there's also added factors in, in the recovery towards equilibrium. And so in periods where there's increased rainfall as, as what happens between 1995 to 2000, um, there, there's a a reversal of the recovery. And what happens is that increased rainfall also contributed to um, remobilization of older sediments. And so even though the river was ten trending towards equilibrium again, that increased rainfall sort of kicked it back towards disequilibrium. And so this is an example of how um, volcanic in, uh, eruptions introduce tons of sediment that um, affects um, sediment yields for up to 20 years. But also another interesting thing about this eruption is that a valley was actually buried um, around the shaded, the gray shaded region such that a bigger drainage system was, was actually severed. And so not only do you introduce tons of sediment, but you also effectively impact the drainage system and change courses, drainage courses and pathways. Um, so now we're going to talk about, um, on a longer time scale, how new landscapes, especially islands, can be created by volcanoes. Um, so there are two main types of volcanic islands. Um, stratovolcanic island arcs are created by subduction. So in this diagram, you can see that the subduction of one volcanic plate, one oceanic plate underneath another, results in the formation of stratovolcanic island arcs. Basaltic Hawaiian volcanoes are frequently associated with hotspots, so they're created as the oceanic lithosphere travels over a hot mantle plume. So geologists have noticed that as volcanic islands pass over a hotspot, their, their morphology often passes through a predictable series of stages. During the initial alkalic stage, the relatively young lithosphere passes over the hotspot and undergoes a small degree of partial melt. The resulting magma from partial melting is rich in alkali elements relative to silica, and because the quantity of magma produced is relatively low, these young volcanoes do not erupt frequently. During the tholeatic building stage, the degree of partial melting increases, so the basalt formed by the magma has a slightly higher concentration of silica. The quantity of magma produced increases dramatically in this stage. Volcanoes in this stage of life erupt frequently. Both Mauna Loa and Mauna Kiloa um, of Hawaii are almost completely made up, more than 95% of lava erupted during the second stage. Um, it's also during this stage that magma chambers develop, allowing magma to efficiently travel to the surface through preheated chambers. So if a magma chamber collapses, it becomes a caldera. During the third stage, the alkalic capping stage, the volcano moves beyond the hotspot and magma production slows. So this produces a lower quantity of magma that is more alkalic with a lower amount of silica. The magma chambers will also cool and the mantle xenoliths, so big chunks of rock that origin originate from deep within the lower mantle, 
are able to be carried to the surface because they cannot settle out of the viscous magma. During the erosion stage, subsistence and erosion become the dominant forces shaping a volcano's morphology. Um, this diagram from Bleachers and Greeley 2008 shows changes in volcano morphology in the Hawaiian Islands with age. So the x-axis is horizontal distance and the y-axis is elevation. So this graphic can be read as a cross-section of the three volcanoes. The first volcano, Mauna Kiloa, is a stage two tholeite stage volcano with lots of magma chambers and tubes that produce hot fluid magma. This magma creates gentle slopes of a low angle. Mauna Loa is in the alkalite capping stage, so the third stage, and has reduced magma production and less, effic less efficient magma tubes that allow more xenoliths to make it to the surface. The slopes are steeper in this stage because of the thicker magma with lots of xenoliths. Mount Akea, um, also in the alkalite capping stage, it has the highest slopes, probably because its lava is even more viscous than that of Mount Aloha. So as you look at this diagram, think about how the slopes, which are determined by um, the age of the volcano and its stage, um, may have an impact on the geomorphology of the surrounding region. Finally, once islands are, or finally, once islands or parts of the island are no longer affected by volcanic activity, we start to see um, the evolution of the landscape by coloniz colonization of life. On islands, gull colonies play a major role in facilitating succession, simply because they are one of the few islands that are few animals that can reach the island because they're so isolated. And once those gull colonies are established, um, they produce waste and other organic matter that will eventually lead to an increase in biodiversity in animals, which can change bio or geomorphology through things like um, burrowing. And we also see an increase in biodiversity in moss, microbial, and grass communities, which together can change um, geochemical processes like decomposition or acidity to overall lead to an increase in erosional rates. Next slide. Um, with increased erosional rates, we see landscapes that look like those on the left, which because of increased erosion, we see that's which is called gullying. And also because of the colonization of grass communities, especially along beaches, we see the sedimentation of um, sand and the growth of island, which leads to, to dune formation as shown on the image on the right. On volcanic landscapes that aren't necessarily islands and aren't isolated, gull colonies don't play as much a major role because, again, the land isn't um, isolated and can be and and succession can be facilitated facilitated by other things. Uh, major factors include dust fall, which we see on the left, which introduce nutrients from the atmosphere, and kapukas, which we see on the right, which are areas not affected by um, volcanism which sit within areas which are affected by volcanism. And because of the presence of life, um, they facilitate biological succession um, after volcanic activity settles out. And finally, over a very long periods of time, we start to see the emergence of erosional landforms. As um, Lucy and Rose both uh, mentioned, we see the formation of necks, dikes, and sills by the um, drying of magma conduits and the drying of magma intrusions into layers of um, pre-existing la land. And we also see the emergence of inselbergs and tors from uh, the emergence of xenoliths and batholiths that were formed deep within uh, magma conduits and magma chambers. And finally, we also see the formation of a landform that is in some ways a mixture of biological colonization and of um, erosion, which is reformation. On, on, on volcanic islands, on the fringes of them, colonize, co reforming corals colonize um, underwater and slowly build up towards sea level, while at the same time, volcanic islands degrade um, until they eventually reach below sea level. So over a long period of time, we see the formation of atolls, which we see on the right, um, again, because islands are degrading while coral reefs are aggrading. And so for an understanding of 
the time scale at which biological colonization happens, we can look at the island of Tepuka in the Funafuti Atoll and the island nation of Tuvalu as an example. Uh, there, scientists dated the sediment to figure out when sedimentation and um, colonization occurred. And they also looked at historical maps and imagery to figure out how the island shape has changed over time. So by dating the sand, they found that um, the, the sediment in the core of the island, which was vegetated and thus wouldn't change because it was uh, stabilized, dated to around 600 years after the formation of the island. So that means it took about 600 years for the island core to become vegetated and for succession to occur. They also found that the island was apparently rotating, as you can see on the image on the left, based on the previous island shapes. And this is because the because of the core of the island was vegetated, it was stable, while the outer fringes were um, eroding or aggrading in different rates, which led to an rotation of the island. And that is our presentation. Thank you.